welcome you to the June 20, 2016 Committee on Community Resources meeting. Um, as you just heard, we are being audio and video recorded. We're actually, you can't hear? Jen, is the mic on? Can you hear? Um, we're being, it's actually being broadcast live on NCTV TV right now, in addition to being taped. So, and then that tape will be available. Um, so usually we take the role, but I'm going to ask counselors to introduce themselves because many of you may not know us. I'll start with myself. I am Gina Louise Shara. I am the Ward 4 City Councilor and I am the Chair of this committee. I'm Dennis Bedwell, Ward 2 City Councilor and I'm Vice Chair of this committee. Maureen Carney, I'm City Councilor from Ward 1. Elisa Pine, City Councilor, Ward 7. <clears throat> and I'll introduce Pam Powers, who is our Administrative Assistant. Um, <clears throat> so now is the time when we call for public comment. If you're here for the public forum, I'd suggest you hold your comment until then, which will be very soon after this point. Um, but if you're here to address the committee on a matter outside the scope of the forums on um, the downtown economy, this would be the time to come address us. Um, the rule of conduct that we follow here in this committee is the same as we do in the full council. We request civility and respect for all participants, though you may say what you would like about us as public figures, um, but, and we will not respond at all during public comment, but during a public forum later, we can interact with you. So that being said, is there anyone who would like to speak to public comment not for the forum? Nope? Okay, then I'm gonna close public comment and ask for um, a motion to approve the minutes from May 3rd, 2016. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve the mi minutes of the May 16th, 2016 meeting. Uh, move to approve. Second. Comment. Comment? Yeah, there are just a couple names that are misspelled. Um, Adam Dunnett's, for instance, is misspelled, so that needs to be corrected. Um, it's D-U-N-E-T-Z pan, which you have in one place, but everywhere else is spelled with a double N. And I actually think I saw uh, Liz Carney is also misspelled. It's with a whatever is the other <laughs> letter that it's not on there. So uh, we'll check that. I think you have a C. Any any further discussion on the minutes? Okay, so with those amendments on name spellings, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. So now we are going to move into the public forum, um, and I'm just going to give a little introduction to kind of put a frame around why we're doing this and what we're doing. Um, today's forum is centered around workers and residents, um, and it's the second in a series of four forums pertaining to a committee study request that this committee received on March 3rd from the City Council President and Vice President. Um, and that request was, quote, to study issues relative to the local economy with a focus on businesses and workers in downtown Northampton and downtown Florence. <clears throat> to address this request, we are gathering current data from within the city um, within the administration and from outside organizations. We've already received reports from the city's economic development director, the director of planning and sustainability, the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, and the UMass Amherst Labor Center. On May 16th, we conducted our first public forum, which was centered around business owners. And after today's, we'll have another next Monday at 1 p.m. for downtown workers. And then the last one is scheduled for July 18th at 5.30 here. Um, and that's around centered around property owners, leasing, arts, and tourism. <clears throat> These public forums are meant to solicit testimony from those directly involved in the downtown's economy. Um, and, and the question, sort of general question we're asking are, what are the pressures that you feel um, and the issues exper you experience in addition to what things do you think are done well or are, what are the things that you think um, can and should be supported. Uh, following these forums, the committee will compile this information into a report for the full city council and consider if there are recommendations of areas where the city council could take action. We will not be deliberating on possible action until we've closed out the forums and have heard from everyone who wishes to testify. To facilitate people following the study, we've created a web page on the city's website at northamptonma.gov 
Um, and that's under the city council section, there is a subhead that's called uh, committee study requests. This gives an overview, kind of like what I'm giving now, um, lists the committee's schedule, links to meetings, uh, info that we've received, and the video from the previous meetings and the agendas and minutes. Um, and it also tells you how to submit written testimony to Pam um, if you don't want to speak in public at a forum. So now as we move into the forum, um, I'll just explain that this is primarily fact-finding for us, and so we want to hear your point of view. But while we're asking for comments specific to your experience, we ask that if you have something negative or defamatory to say about someone or a business, that you do not refer to them by name or by any obvious identifier. This is not a forum for grievances against specific people or businesses, and we are not an enforcement body for any perceived violations. Um, I'm sure this won't be necessary, but I have the right to rule someone out of order if I feel like that request isn't being followed. Um, so when you come to the podium, and I have a sign-up sheet, so I'm going to call everyone by name, and then after that, I'll ask if there's anyone who'd like to speak who didn't sign up. Um, <clears throat> when you come to the podium, please state your name and your address for the record. We're going to ask that you limit your comments to five minutes, um, and uh, hopefully five minutes is the right amount of time. You've, there are a lot of you here. Um, to, so we're, and we're doing that just to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. Um, if someone said something that, you've, that you're interested in saying, feel free to say ditto or that you agree with uh, a previous comment. You don't, don't feel the need to say it again. Um, and when the five minutes are up, if you're still speaking, I'm going to ask you to please finish your thought and give someone else a turn. Once everyone who wishes to speak has spoken, if there's more time, people could have another opportunity. Um, so, and while anyone can speak to the general topic of downtown economy, um, you may have hit the lights. Um, this forum has been designated for workers and residents to give direct testimony to the committee. So, um, for workers, the priority is going to be hearing directly from, either from workers or via an interpreter, uh, instead of from representatives on their behalf because some have already spoken in previous meetings. So I'm going to request that organizers refrain from, from speaking for at least initially so that workers can have the opportunity to speak for themselves. So with that, I'm going to start with my list. Yeah. OK, so it'll beep when five minutes have passed. OK, so you'll hear a beep, and that'll mean that you've been speaking for five minutes. Um, so the first person who signed up is Bess. Hepner. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it can hear you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Bess Hepner, and I am a former server at Zen Restaurant. As many of you know, the restaurant unexpectedly shut down about a month ago, leaving me and my 16 coworkers jobless and about 10 of them homeless. But what you may not know is before the restaurant shut down, there was a lot of wage theft happening. Every night for <coughs> six or so months before the closing of the restaurant, I met up with other servers after work to talk about the stolen wages during our shifts. These were not things that we were sure of, but we would um, do a rough calculation at the end of every night and figure that our boss was stealing approximately uh, anywhere between $10 to $100 from each of us. I also know, knew for a fact that I had other coworkers who were making far below the minimum wage. At lowest, one of my coworkers was making a, around $5.50 an hour, and many of them were making around $7, $8, $9 an hour without any overtime pay, and this was all under the table. It's hard to communicate the feeling of being exploited at a restaurant and knowing that you're being exploited and feeling extremely powerless in this situation. And this was not a unique case. All of my coworkers who have found new restaurant work along the East Coast are working for the same wages, more or less, under the same conditions in other places. And although we knew our boss was breaking the law, we were scared to speak out. We talked to a lawyer who assured us that we were in the right, but we were still scared. We confronted our boss. I one time asked her why I did not receive any paycheck, any hourly wage, and she told me, well, all that money goes to taxes on your tips. It's the government taking your money, it's not me, which I knew was a lie. 
Um, we met together after work and talked on the phone for hours. But even though we were united, we were still scared. My coworkers, many of whom were undocumented immigrants, feared that even though the law protected them, that speaking out would cause the bosses to bully them at work, report them to the police, fire them, and kick them out of their housing. What I kept thinking during this process is it should not be the responsibility of workers to protect ourselves and our wages. We are already risking so much just going to work. We're already put through so much hard labor. It should not, on top of that, be our job to enforce a law that already exists. Had there been an ordinance, a wage theft ordinance during this time, none of this wage theft would have happened. We wouldn't have been afraid. We would have been protected. Now that the, boss of Zen have sold, now the, the bosses of Zen have sold the business, we are afraid that they are running away with our stolen wages. My coworkers need that money to send back to their families and their countries, build houses back home, afford plane tickets to return to their families, and to live day to day in the US. They did not come to this country to be exploited. A wage theft ordinance is just the first step. Of course, there's a lot more that I think that needs to be done. We need to be treated like human beings at our workplace. I think there's a real lack of respect among workers, and there's definitely a hierarchy in workplaces. We also need to end sexual harassment in restaurants, and we need to stop discriminating against those who don't speak fluent English. But a wage theft ordinance is a necessary first step. If we can't uphold wage and hour laws, what can this city government do for restaurant workers? Will we have to struggle to win all our wages ourselves at risk of job loss, lots of emotional labor and so much more, housing loss, shaming at work, and deportation? Or will those of you in power stand with us? Thank you. Um, there's some seats that are available in the front if people standing in the back like, like one. Um, and also, I'm, again, I'm going to, even though this is a business that's now out of business, I'm going to ask people to not name businesses by name or name individuals by name. Um, next up, Patrick Burke, maybe? It's hard to read. Burke. Burke? I, I, I do work for a labor organization, so if you'd like to have a worker speak. That would be great if you would let someone else go first. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and next, I see Amy Bookbinder. Are you speaking as a resident? Yes. Okay. I just have a couple. You, I'm sorry, can you state your name and your address, oh, please? Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue in Leeds. And I, I just have a couple of comments. Um, I'm here in support of the wage theft ordinance, which I think is just a no-brainer. Um, it, it seems to me all it's asking is that the city, um, in order to license, is that the city should license only businesses that comply with existing law. So I see no reason why anybody wouldn't uh, pass that ordinance. And I guess the other brief thing I want to say is that many of us in this room attended a funeral a month or so ago in Amherst for a worker who was horribly abused and killed himself. And, um, you know, this isn't just a political agenda or a nice, you know, thing to do for people. It, it's serious, and it's, it's life or death for some among us. So, again, I hope you will pass the wage theft ordinance. Thank you. Next, Jonathan Wynn. your time. Hello. Um, for slightly a, a different topic, I guess. Name My name is Jonathan please. Wynn. Um, I'm a homeowner at uh, 25 Summer Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. I'm also a professor of sociology who's published books on uh, and articles on cities, communities, and local culture. And so I'd like to speak not on workers' rights. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. You're a resident. OK. So you can, as long as you're speaking yeah. to the downtown um, economy, that fulfills the mission. Great. Um, I, I appreciate the comments that have been stated so far. 
I would also like to thank uh, the Councillor Jean Liu Sierra Chair for holding this comprehensive series of public hearings on downtown Northampton, keenly addressing our various stakeholders. But first, I'd like to say a few words about our homeless population. I think that uh, my neighbors and downtown business owners uh, can and should be a little more nuanced in their thinking regarding our homeless population. Homelessness is not a cause of our downturn in our, our downtown economy. They're a symptom of wider economic forces. They don't get their own hearing in the Northampton uh, downtown economy, but they're still stakeholders in our community, and our community should be stakeholders in them. That said, um, I think that Northampton could generate a few more desirables, uh, and I hate that term, undesirables, uh, in downtown by extracting some of our cultural resources that we have at our disposal. Research in cities indicates that culture draws crowds, more people make more successful places. Looking ahead, I think there are plenty of cases of cities successfully using public spaces like ours, and, they, and we can learn a lot from them. I've even seen cities successfully enliven gritty free, freeway overpasses. So I think it's important to note that we have a lot going for us. Um, I think there are dozens of programming activities that work in other places and there's no reason why they couldn't enliven our public spaces here. Our, when our Pulaski Park reopens, for example, I hope it will be heavily programmed. Convince the, pro, uh, the Tuesday market to move there in order to broaden the visibility and accessibility of fresh produce for folks <coughs> using our transit hub. Work with the Forbes Library to establish a pop-up library in the park at regular intervals. The last I counted, there are 4,507 a cappella groups at Smith College, and surely one of them would accept an invitation to perform at the park, et cetera, et cetera. I'm so glad you're paying attention. Thank you. Here's an idea that's worked elsewhere. Build the expectation of zero vacancy by filling vacant spaces with local art. In downtown Minnesota, a cultural district worked with landlords and sponsors to fill windows with art. Working with Anderson Windows, you get it, the promotion? Um, they. They uh, installed art in a series of vacant spaces across 15 city blocks. They flipped nine properties with over 50 years of vacancy into long-term residence. A pilot project could be encouraged here, possibly incentivized, if not coordinated with the Northampton Arts Council, then perhaps a group like APE, or even Candace Hope and James Hindle, who did this great Imaginary Valley uh, uh, website just by focusing on one or two storefronts. Build a greater buy-in from landlords, attract sponsorship from a major local business like Kool-Aid Dick, Coca-Cola, Smith College. There's no reason that it cannot find some success here. Perhaps these are the types of conversations that will be had on July uh, 18th hearing, but consider this a full-throated endorsement from a local resident, and I'll be out of town, so sorry. I'm doing that now. Last, I'd like to wholeheartedly embrace the recommendations of our planning department to make our downtown core more accessible with wider sidewalks, making space for the public, consumers, and loiterers. Easier, some cafes and restaurants to set up outdoor dining spaces and public tables and chairs that are open to everyone. The earlier comment was particularly for my local business owner wife. And uh, improved bike lanes. Anyone who did not attend, attend the public forum this weekend missed a wonderful peek into what could lie ahead for our community. Good-natured cajoling definitely has its place, but a city can likely do better to build, maintain, and, make, and mend partnerships in these efforts, to coax collaborations, connect cultural assets with shy stakeholders, and match stable institutions with innovative opportunities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Jenna? Yeah. Okay. As someone who's Name is Gina. Okay, wrong. I've got a lot of Gina. Pronounce it Jenna so all the time. I thought I'd check. Thank you. I'm Jenna Sujat, and my address here is 179 Main Street, where I own Pinch, and have owned it for 10 years. Um, so I had been a resident of Northampton for many years. I'm not anymore. Um, I'm a business owner and a worker. And I appreciate Jonathan's ideas. They're very positive. They're very focused on the positive, which I like. Um, I wanted to talk about something that is has been a little tricky to talk about, so I hope you all have patience with my finding the right words. Um, and it, it has to do with um, all the people who ask for handouts around town and how that has grown over the years. And it's, it's something that is not only annoying if you walk up and down the street every day, five days a week, but I feel that from talking to members of the community and customers, I hear all the time that it keeps people from walking up and down Main Street. And I wish there were a way to distinguish between people who are in need and are homeless and are hungry and people who aren't. 
because I feel like a lot of people offer people food and they don't want it, they don't need it, they just want money for whatever. I wish there was a way to distinguish that and sort of limit it. And I know whenever people have tried to do something about this over the last 10 years that I've been a store owner, business owners and people who want to try to do something about it have been framed as selfish, which is not true, have been framed as enemies of the poor, enemies of the homeless, which is not true. Um, and it's a real simplistic way of looking at the issue. I, d I think it's enabling if you're giving money to people who are using it to further I'm not going to judge what people are using the money for, but it can be enabling and it's not necessarily helping anybody. And it's frustrating when the problem gets phrased, framed so simplistically that people are demonized for it and really lose an, a voice at all, which I feel like is what has happened historically when anything has been tried to be changed about it. We are just demonized and the other voice is so huge that ours is just completely shut down and that has been hurtful and frustrating and I wish there was a way to do something about it that felt good to everybody and I don't know what that is but that's my pleading to new city council members thank you, thank you. Um, I've neglected before to ask the committee if they have questions for the people who've come up so does anyone any, anyone have questions for Jenna or for anyone who's spoken before I know, no? Okay, thank you, Jenna. Um, Lois Shelley Schifflin? Um, good evening, my name is Shelley Shefflin and I live in Florence at Nine Hill Crest. Um, I would like to address um, the city council about um, workers, restaurant workers. Um, this, uh, for the past uh, two years, I have been a tutor at the Center for New Americans, and in that capacity, I have met a, uh, some workers who, uh, who have worked at local restaurants and have since left Northampton. And um, in addition to that, I've lived in Northampton for 30 years and have always really enjoyed uh, eating at downtown restaurants. I have to say, in, uh, since I have become aware of issues at many of the restaurants, uh, enjoying eating in downtown Northampton has taken um, a turn, and um, I elected for my birthday not to uh, patronize a restaurant in downtown Northampton. So in addition to this being a worker's issue. It is also an issue of people feeling comfortable and confident and wanting to patronize restaurants in downtown. Um, and as of now, as of yet, I have not made any negative comments um, online about any specific restaurant. Um, I'm holding my tongue for a while, but I do want to see what happens. Um, the students that I were uh, was working with or were working with um, were very hesitant to start talking to me but when they did start talking the floodwaters broke open and it turned out that they were working in a restaurant where um, at least from the perspective of um, the workers there was widespread wage theft going on and um, a lawyer was brought in to talk to uh, the workers. They were all very nervous about um, working with the lawyer and having their boss find out. Many of the workers were undocumented, not all of them, um, but even the people who were citizens and here on green cards were very um, nervous. And I have to say that uh, for me it was very surprising because I had never really thought about going out to a restaurant. I am now very aware that when I go to a restaurant, I really don't know what is going on uh, either with the wait staff, whether they are getting their tips um, or how the kitchen staff is being treated. Um, the 
uh, people that I was tutoring um, were in their 50s, were working 10 and 12 hours a day, six days a week. Um, one of them has a uh, problem uh, with one of his legs or his hips and was on his feet almost the whole time. There did not seem, um, from what I understood, there did not seem to be dedicated bathroom break. Um, if they did need to go to the bathroom, it was hurry, 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 get back. Um, I think that frequently they ate um, while they were working if there was a little lull. So um, we want Northampton to be a lively, vibrant city. We want to have a good reputation. We want people to come to our restaurants to enjoy all of the cultural activities. If that is the case, then we need to make sure that our workers are um, treated fairly with respect and that wage theft is not going on because there is a restaurant that I really wanted to go to for my birthday and when I found out about it, I was like, no, I'm not going there. And that's a downtown business. So, which takes taxes, I believe, from the city if people aren't going to the restaurants. Thank you very much for listening to me and that's it. Anyone have any questions for Shelley? <clears throat> um, next up is Adam Rose. Hi, I'm Adam Rose. I'm now a resident of Hadley, Russell Street, but formerly of Eastern Avenue in Northampton. And I've worked in hotels and restaurants in downtown Northampton. Uh, I'm here in support of the wage theft ordinance that's been proposed uh, in the community. And what I will say is I have a deep love and respect for the owners of downtown Northampton businesses. And I understand they take enormous financial risk when opening a business and continuing to operate. Um, and they are the reason why so many of us even have jobs. but. All too often, I've seen firsthand and been witness to the deep amount financial pressures that face owners being an excuse for uh, unfair treatment of workers, unsafe working conditions, and uh, all of which would amount, which amount to um, a, a general lack of dignity on the part of restaurant workers and service industry workers in Northampton, which is just the industries I have experienced personally working in. Um, so I thank the council for hearing me speak today. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Jang Lin. Did I pronounce that right? If you also could just tell us where you live, that would be. If you could sure. just say your name again and where you live, yeah. that would be helpful. Gain Ling, I'm Gain Ling. I live at uh, Two West Street, Northampton. Um, I'm a restaurant worker. Um, I think most of us already heard about what's happening in at Zen, and so here I just want to share my own experience about restaurant as a restaurant worker. Um, I've worked in the restaurant industry for over 14 years. And um, I work 15 different restaurants in six different states. Um, my first job was in New Jersey. I was a kitchen helper, and I um, and I made. I worked 74 hours a week, and I made $1,300 a month, which was four dollars per hour. <coughs> I worked in Connecticut for four years as a cashier and a line cook. I work. Uh, I make two thousand three hundred dollars a month, and I work seventy hours a week, which was seven seven dollar fifty cents per hour. And my last job was here at Zen. I made one thousand six hundred dollars when I started, and sixty two hours a week, which was six dollar per hour. Not until a few months ago, before the restaurant closed, I finally made minimum wage. 
I was lucky that I made minimum wage, but many of my co-workers, they don't make, they never make minimum wage. The bus boy makes, the dishwasher makes six dollars per hour, bus boy makes seven dollars per hour, and the cook makes eight dollars per hour. Bosses not only steal our wages, but also didn't pay us the overtime. Um, I like to go out to eat in a restaurant where its workers can at least, at least make minimum wage. A restaurant where its worker can pay their rent. A restaurant its worker um, can go to hospital without worry about a medical bill when it got cut or burned. A restaurant where its worker not only can put the food on the table for customer, but also put the food on their own tables. And this is my goal and uh, to work with you and work with everyone here to pass the waste step ordinance in order to protect us from the um, exportation of the owner. Um, I, often, I often see or hear this term called Happy Valley when I walk downtown or listen to the radio. And I think that's a nice and attractive term, but I find myself a hard time to connect to it. For me, that this term is like a boat floating on the water, on the surface, and beneath, underneath that surface, there are many unhappy things happening, as I experience in a restaurant. <coughs> um, yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that, and uh, <coughs> we can, I, um, we can work together to pass the ordinance in order to make this place a real, truly happy valley. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions? Um, so, Rose, you're next. Is that okay if I'm gonna skip over you for now? Okay. Um, Jonah, are you speaking as a worker? Where, I tell you, where, are oh, there you are. I'm a resident and a former restaurant worker. Please. My name is Jonah Vorspan Stein. I live at 13 Monroe Street in Northampton, your district, Jonah. Um, and I was a food service worker in this area for over three years. Um, and I guess I'd just like to say that after listening to everyone speak, really all any of us are asking for is for the laws that already exist to be enforced. And I know in my experience as a restaurant worker, they just weren't. There was not a month that I worked where my wages or my coworkers' wages weren't stolen. My wages personally have been stolen by being asked to punch out for breaks and then told to work through those breaks, being asked to punch out after my eight hour shift ends and then being told to stay until the work is finished and working over 40 hours in a week without being paid time and a half. And I actually about a few months into my first job did bring this up to my boss at the time and I was told this look this is the job if you don't want to do it we can find someone else who will and if you talk with someone who works in restaurants in Northampton and they feel safe actually talking to you the labor wage and hour laws in this town are laughed at there is no one enforcing them and that's been my experience that's the experience of many of my friends is that the Department of Labor, any state agency, is not doesn't isn't looking into this, and if and it's not something that feels like an option to most workers, if unless you want to be retaliated against. And so, to me, I know I've heard um, business owners or some workers say that look, there are already laws for this. You know, why do we need? This is redundant. These laws already exist. But I know for myself and for a lot of my friends who still work in this industry, this would be an incredible reassurance. And if we actually want the laws that exist to have some impact on what our jobs are like, that I don't think at all this is redundant. This is totally necessary. Um, yeah, thank you. Can I ask you a quick question, John? Sure. Um, so when, how, do you, how do you imagine the enforcement would happen if there was an ordinance? How would, how would that enforcement be different than the lack of enforcement that you're seeing now? Yeah, well, honestly, I, have, I would have to see actually what's really being proposed. And I got up here to say that something needs to happen and that the enforcement that happens now is totally insufficient. 
and if there was a body that was appointed to actually investigate independently and then say that this is happening or or if there was some other mechanism for enforcement that isn't in my experience um, there was once I had a friend who was working in a restaurant that I won't name where it was found that people's wages were being stolen and those wages were paid back and there was a poster that was put up in the in the kitchen that said we sorry we won't do it again and it was just cheaper for that employer to say okay well we had to pay this worker back, but one in ten workers reports it, so we're just going to keep doing it. We know it's illegal, but all that happened to us was we had to put a little sign up in our kitchen. And so the, it's just cheaper to continue to disregard the laws, and maybe once in one in every ten cases you have to pay it back and you have to pay a penalty on top of it. But right now the enforcement doesn't prevent an employer from choosing to do this. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, that is everyone who signed up right now who I didn't skip over. It, is there anyone else who would like to speak who did not sign up? Your great uh, gentleman in front and then gentleman back. Sorry. Yeah. Right there in green. <laughs> I understand that was maybe not the clearest way for me to describe that. Yes, please. Please come forward and if you could state your name and your address. Hi, my name is Harris Freeman. I live on 55 Fort Street. I've been a resident of Northampton for about 17 years. I also teach labor and employment law at Western New England University and at the Labor Center at the University of Massachusetts. And I wanted to speak a little bit to the, the need for this kind of uh, local endeavor to make sure that federal and state laws are effectively enforced and, and why this is a good investment of time and energy for the community and why it's really necessary uh, today to do it. Um, we're, we're seeing an epidemic of wage theft in the United States in, in the low wage sector. Uh, people have documented it here in town. It's not exceptional. It's uh, really pretty epidemic uh, around the United States. And this is creating big challenges when you have both federal and state agencies that have their own budgetary restrictions and challenges in having enough people on, the, uh, on their own roles to really enforce laws that they are supposed to enforce. There's a real shortage of mechanisms of enforcement particularly for things like wage theft. Um, we don't have a structure in the United States that creates inspections to see that wages are adequately paid in low wage sectors. And we have a population who are working in these sectors, many of whom are particularly vulnerable. They're, they're for good reason uncomfortable coming forward to complain about the kind of problems we see. This is particularly true given the number of immigrant workers that we see, for example, in the restaurant sector in the United States and construction in the United States and, of course, right here in Northampton and in Western Massachusetts. So creating a means uh, with relatively few resources to have a local community partner with essentially the federal and state governments to make sure that the laws are enforced is a really effective means of sort of maximizing our, our resource use to bring us the kind of workplaces and public places that we want to go to here in Northampton. And I, I think by adding this extra layer of enforcement, not an extra layer of regulation, there's no new regulations that are being imposed on, on anybody. So any kind of argument that says, you know, this is going to be a costly regulation really isn't the case. It's really a means of uh, asking employers to understand that there are going to be serious consequences if they don't do what the law requires them to ordinarily do. And I think these kind of efforts have proved really effective in other communities across the United States, where you have community organizations partnering with local governments to make sure laws that we don't really have local control over. I mean, this is part of the problem. We, we can't ask the government to step up enforcement in Northampton. Uh, and one way that we can step up enforcement is to put uh, some measure of oversight into the hands of the community to create a greater level of security for our workforce and to make 
the patrons who come to town and the citizens of, of this town feel good about the kind of business enterprises that we have here. And that is, I think, an important value that we widely share um, in Northampton and in the Valley. So that, that's my thought. I think it's a great idea. I think it's, uh, it's the kind of uh, endeavor that a local community can take to really make a difference without increasing the cost of taxes, without increasing uh, the burden in a significant way on, on local government. Can, so can you tell me a little bit more about what that partnership has looked like in other communities? How, I mean, how, what kind of agency does that enforcement that doesn't then create, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, budgetary issue? Well, uh, I, I, I think that these kinds of things of creating a, an avenue for people to complain about and, uh, and enforce local laws really isn't creating any kind of burden on business. Uh, the idea of creating some kind of, of, uh, of body of, of people in the community who would serve, I don't really know that there's a cost been attached to, to any of the proposals that have been made in terms of uh, who is going to be involved in looking to see that, that uh, local laws, uh, wage laws are enforced or that people are complying with in order to get their beverage licenses and so forth. So it, what, what it really does, it gives a, a channel of communication between the bodies in town that ordinarily have to uh, enforce these laws, meaning the, the, the laws for licensing of, of restaurant establishments, to make sure that these businesses are on the up and up. So it really is what's been happening here with, with organizations like the Pioneer Valley Worker Center, which has given voice to a whole range of people in our community, is what's going on in cities large and small across the country. You're seeing more partnerships, not just with local governments, but you're seeing partnerships with uh, organizations like worker centers and state attorney general's offices, which we have here in Massachusetts. I mean, the challenge for the attorney general's office in enforcing this is really resources. So this amplifies the resources of enforcement in really significant ways. And if problems are identified, it also gives the attorney general's office the opportunity to step in and, and if necessary, prosecute and make an example of real problem uh, businesses. So, so what I think we're really seeing is a situation where if you had, you know, where you have sectors of the economy where you have labor unions, you have workers who have a voice who can sit down directly with their employer and deal with these problems. We're talking about sectors here that don't have unions. And where's the voice for workers if local government doesn't partner with community organizations to create a comfortable means of uh, providing information to city government so that we can make sure that our values and our laws are enforced. Uh, so I, I really think this is a kind of uh, partnership that is going to succeed because we have community members who are taking responsibility, who are not elected officials, who are um, you know, not looking to gain a paid post in city government or anything. So I, I think that the, the opportunities for doing this are really a, a low cost, high benefit endeavor. Thank you. Anyone? Oh. Yeah, as, as, as follow-up, help, help me understand with some examples uh, in, other, in other communities when you talk about a, 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 a community, well, a community I, I, partnership with, right. with local government which in turn is obviously connected to the Attorney General's office. Well, the how, how, how would it work? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I'm just curious to I think the walk me through how it might work. Well, I, I think if you, if you look at historically, labor organizations, labor unions have played that role in our society for a long time. They've been seen as authoritative voices representing the interests of workers, and when they speak up and talk to elected officials, to uh, government agencies like the Attorney General's Wage and Hour Division, they're listened to because they are known to be authoritative voices <coughs> representing people who are otherwise don't have a voice in a problem. And I think what's begun to happen is other kinds of organizations have stepped up to fill a void where, where we have sectors of our workforce that don't have unions to represent them. And organizations like worker centers, community organizations in, in poor communities across the country have developed partnerships with uh, local and state government entities. It's happened quite extensively in the Boston area 
as a, as a coalition between legal service organizations, a coalition of worker centers, and both uh, the city of Boston government and uh, the attorney general's office. So it's really opening up channels of communication. And I think what the, the ordinance is looking to do is, is to create another level to enforce laws that already exist without really creating a new level of, of really bureaucratic uh, uh, regulations at something new. It's simply asking the city to make sure that people are enforcing uh, laws that are on the books and giving, um, giving the city a mechanism to make sure that it's done. I hope that speaks to your... Yeah, yeah that, that's helpful. So, so, so where this has been successfully uh, uh, employed, where, at what level of city government I, 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 I get the, you know, a, a, worker, a, a worker center, a labor union cites a, a, a problem yeah. as compelling evidence. Where in local government uh, does that go and then where are the resources in local government to actually do something? I, I think that th that's, been, that's been approached different ways. You, there are already bodies that are looking to create licensing endeavors. They might, they might have to look into a complaint. I believe the ordinance was looking at some mechanisms to create a body that could look into these problems and to uh, create a reporting system here. So I, I don't think we're, we're talking about creating uh, in town an office with uh, paid officials or any kind of uh, uh, formal, formal body of that sort from what I understand about the ordinance and, and, and the suggestion here. It might be useful to, um, Councillor Carney and I have been working with um, some folks in the community on an ordinance, and I think that's what a lot of people are referring to here, um, without it being clear to the other councillors, because we haven't necessarily shared this yet with other councillors. So I, just to kind of clue um, my colleagues in here, they need to know that this ordinance is in the works. Yeah, I, I was... It hasn't been made clear yet. Yeah, I, I was trying to speak more generally... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to speak more generally about the fact that there have been these kind of local efforts to make sure that state and federal laws are enforced and that the, the effort in the community is to provide another level of, of enforcement mechanism without really creating uh, a new law that uh, the city would be um, using for it. So I, I was really trying to speak to the idea that, that uh, there ought to be a mechanism to make sure that uh, you know, parts of the economy in town where there's been identified problems where we have a means of addressing it. Because part of the problem we have right now is a resource level on the federal and state government that isn't reaching the scope of the problem. And I think that's readily and widely um, un understood right now. And I think that that's putting communities like ours in a place where we have a chance to step in and uh, be part of solving a problem that we know exists. So th those are my thoughts. Thank you for that Thank you for listening. <clears throat> it's true. We don't actually have an ordinance in front of us. That's, that is before us as a body. So um, thank you for um, clarifying that. Okay. Hello to the council today, the community. Um, my name is Manny Pintado. Um, I'm a resident of 20 Hampton Avenue here in Northampton. I live in Northampton for over 12 years. Um, I'm here as a member from the Peace and Justice Committee from First Churches and also from the Steering Committee of Western Mass Justice with Justice. And I'm here to implore you to please pay, pass the West Step Ordinance on behalf of the workers of the city of Northampton. I believe that everybody deserves to get paid for their work hours. And if you're not paid, then you have all the right to ask to your employer if he refuses to answer you and threatens the employer whether legal on the commented person, restaurant owners or bosses are committing a crime. The crime of waste theft and therefore should be accountable for his and her crimes actions. No one should be put through abuse, whether physical or mental, at work. We are all human and deserve respect. Some works have been told many lies and those that are undocumented threats of deportation. Please I urge you to pass the waste step ordinance. Therefore the workers can feel protected. They can perform their daily work. The customers who go into the restaurants and places of business are glad to be spending their money. The establishments that are treating the workers fair are making the money, and therefore, Northampton can be as prosperous as, as it should. And just, you know, common sense. If you work, you got to get paid. I mean, you, 
you, you work, therefore you get paid. So I guess everybody who gets who's working and are doing their hours that should get paid. Thank you. Anyone any questions for Mr. Ventana? Thank you. Um, so anyone else who would like to speak again with an, um, yeah, a, a worker or resident? Both. Step to the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So uh, my name is Ben Wilsey. Uh, I just recently moved from Northampton to Florence, Massachusetts, but I lived at uh, 206 Elm Street for three years, and I just moved to 282 Spring Street in Florence. Um, I love this area. I'm not originally from this area. I'm originally from Rochester, New York, um, but uh, started with the Berkshires before here for a few years, and uh, now I'm loving this town. I work at one of the restaurants in town now for almost two years, um, and I love it there, and I've switched my hours around. I've been started at a server. Uh, I've also been uh, doing uh, register working the register as well and jumping between serving and <coughs> registering within a shift as well as I do delivery driving for them as I also work for another restaurant owned by the same people in Florence, Massachusetts. <coughs> um, so, and I've worked several different restaurants in my life um, between fine dining um, to, uh, to sports bar to regular casual restaurant, um, you know, all types, different, different jobs in serving or food running type um, area, or also I worked at a um, a top resort uh, in Cape Cod. Um, actually, it was the Chatham Bars Inn. I don't mind naming that, whatever. Um, and uh, I was assistant beverage manager and uh, and receiving clerk for them during college for a summer. Uh, so I worked in the back of the house of a high end there as well. And my point is that I've had a lot of restaurant and service industry experience, made a lot of friends in that industry. Um, also, my gregarious character, I've made a lot of friends with customers. I know that I've had a huge impact on all of the restaurants I've worked on, but especially the one that I'm at now, which is pretty new. I know that I've had a huge impact on the their success as a business and the customers who become regular customers to that restaurant. Um, and I've been told so by my other co-workers there who were there when I was not there and have had many requests for, is Ben here today? Is Ben working? No, or can Ben deliver my food to my house? You know, he's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and a lot of the customers ask me if I am the owner or if I am the manager because of the way that I uh, approach them and, and um, deal with them and pay attention to detail and so forth. Um, and from the beginning, I've made a big effort to be very friendly and uh, respectful um, with everyone in the restaurant, treat them like my family, treat them like it is my own establishment. Um, and uh, so I get along well with people in the kitchen, the dishwasher, everybody, thank the dishwasher when I take the bus bucket back to them, you know, all that kind of thing. So I have a lot of respect for everybody that works in the restaurant, and I understand the difference between wages and hours, and I'm lucky. I can come in for, you know, the second half of the day you know, I've had a great day doing whatever I want, and I come in, and I am uh, can be all cheery, and I can do my short shift and getting out of there, and I don't have to be there and from the whole day, like guys in the kitchen, seven days a week or six days a week. I have a very flexible schedule um, where I also, um, and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur as well. I'm developing many businesses, and I will for the rest of my life. I don't, technically, I don't have to work in a restaurant, but I love the work. Um, and I love the interaction with the community, and I love to be proud of that. And with what's going on right now, um, with these issues like the wage theft and uh, things with like Northampton Hotel and Zen and stuff like that, it doesn't make me so proud. And I feel like I'm lucky at the restaurant I'm at um, to have great bosses who are treat us like family generally and, and let us have the time off when we need as long as it's covered, whatever. Um, but. Uh, you know, it's a tough situation, and I, I, I would like to be able to continue to stay proud to work in that industry and in this town and continue to recommend all of the restaurants um, and all of the service industry. Um, and uh, I feel like I have a lot of background in that, too, and understanding where uh, my father's a businessman, my grandfather was, a lot of people in my family, my um, 
my mom has worked for the underserved population all her life, um, creating toy libraries in Rochester, and now in the Cape, she's working on that. Um, she's done a lot for underserved population. I have a close friend who does a lot with uh, refugee people and, and immigrants in Ro back in Rochester. Um, and uh, and uh, my sister works for uh, Interaction Institute for Social Change out of Boston. Now she lives in Atlanta doing a lot of work and doing workshops on all this for the underserved population and racism and sexism and all that sort of stuff. So, um, and I have another bro brother who uh, works, he, well he got a master's from Schumacher Center for New Economics in, in England. So I have a lot of... Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Anyway, I'm sorry I've talked a long time, but thank you, and I feel very strong about this issue. So I just want to give you a breath of my... Thank you. Thank we you. Appreciate, You're welcome. We appreciate it. Um, anyone? Jen, are you, do you have something you want to tell me? Oh, yeah. It, as a, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before, when you raised your hand, I didn't realize you wanted to... I'd like Please. to speak. Hi, I'm Jen Ramsey, uh, 55 Shamur Road, Hadley. I used to live in this city. Um, I just want to speak uh, for a second about the music community. Um, I've lived in Northampton on and off for the past decade or so. I currently work in Northampton and reside in Hadley because I was unable to find affording housing in the city. Um, but I'm not here to speak about that. I'm here to speak about the independent music community here in Northampton, which is pretty much the biggest reason why I moved here and I've lived here for so long. Um, I myself am a musician, a huge supporter of live music, and have built a lot of friendships over it. Um, but over the years, we've seen so many of the music venues and bars change hands and close. And now there's so few places left for my community of musicians to play and enjoy seeing a live band in Northampton, so we book shows and play in other towns and cities. Um, I'm friends with some of the promoters who book or have booked bands in these bars and venues, and I know there's desire to keep an independent music scene in the city thriving, but there aren't any affordable places in Northampton for us to purchase a venue. So um, the only venues left, really, I mean, there's a few others, but um, are all owned by the same person, and they ask local bands to sell a certain amount of tickets to play, and they'll take a cut of their merch sales, so we don't patronize them. Um, so I just think this is a big loss for this city because um, a lot of touring musicians as well as local bands and stuff, they would patronize the city, the downtown shops, eat in the restaurants, um, and also patronize the venues that, that we played at. Um, so I just want to express my concern about that because, yeah, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks for doing double duty of camera and participating. Um, anybody? Yes? I'm Sharon Moulton. I live at 48 Evergreen Road in Leeds, and I'm talking as a citizen. And I just want to recount what happened on my way here. I was a little early. I stopped in some place to get something to eat, and um, it, 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 the place wasn't very busy. And I was talking with the server, and I told her where I was going, and um, in a what the event was in my involvement with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center and I asked her about the situation where she was working and she told me that there were things where the laws weren't being followed. So I you know as somebody who eats out and would like to be comfortable eating I'm thinking I may never go back there or I'd like some way to know that where I eat I'm not, um, I'm not enabling people to make money off of people uh, off of their workers. So that's a big concern, and one reason why instead of going out to eat a lot lately, I've eaten at the River Valley Co-op, where I know that the workers are unionized and. So that's my point of view as a resident, and I'd like to be more comfortable eating out. Thank you. <coughs> Any question? Any, uh, anyone else? I will, I will get back to yours, I promise. But any, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, please, right here. Hi, I used to be a worker, and I live in Amherst. Sir, could you please state your name? Oh, sorry, my name is Zhen Xiaoyu. And, and could you also just tell us your address in Amherst? Um, 990 North Pleasant Street. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. 
Um, I was not planning on speaking today, but I was so empowered by other speeches, and I think it will be a great chance to step out mm -hmm. and s say what I know. Um, at the vigil for rinsing, an undocumented Tibetan worker who hung himself at the employee storm on April 22nd, a woman approached me and she said, I'm sorry for your loss. I look at her and I squeeze a smile. What she doesn't know is Rinsey and I were not very close. We were just coworkers. To be honest, I don't even know whether the death is considered lost to me. Thank you for being here as I'm giving out a credit for her present. At least she's here. At least someone cares. <clears throat> I don't she say she continues and say, I don't know why it was not he was not contact with the Tibetan communities and in addition I know a woman in church who helps a lot of immigrant work undocumented workers. Why didn't he reach out? Why didn't he? A simple question captures the unequal relationship between the askers and the subject relate related. Why didn't he you sue the restaurant? Why didn't he go back to a school? Why didn't he quit? Why didn't he go to another restaurant? Why didn't he seek out? Or simply ask, why didn't he stay in Tibet where he came from? I just want to um, inform or let everyone know how vulnerable these workers are. We're in a situation that we're not very protected and we're very scared to seek out or without any resources that people think, oh, you should have done. So I just want the city council can done something to protect us and to make it more fair for us. Thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon. My name is Ruth Tirado. I used to be a resident here in Northampton. I resided at 491 Bridge Road for about 12 years, and I moved to East Hampton for last year. Um, current address is 324 Main Street. So um, I want to speak on behalf of Pioneer Valley workers, um, and I also want to speak on behalf of a good friend of mine who moved many years ago um, while I was working at a local restaurant. And part of the experiences that I witnessed working five years at a um, restaurant was that I am documented. I'm a documented Im immigrant. And from the liberties that I experienced, I had flexibility in my, my schedule. I was able to really um, voice my opinion on an injustice that, uh, or a disagreement with my bosses. But I really want to speak in on behalf of those who d don't have those protections and don't feel at liberty to speak freely of their feelings of exploitation and their feelings of um, unprotection, like not feeling protected in terms of democratic voice and um, liberty. Uh, Marta was a good friend who um, worked about 50 hours a week and only barely made minimum wage of $7 an hour. She was a single mother. She lived here for about four years before um, she had to move back to Mexico. And most of what she regretted was loving the job and being grateful for the employers, but mostly for not being able to provide heat and electricity in her own apartment for her son during the winter. And you know our winters are rather cold. Um, I don't speak in public much, but um, I just want to really voice my opinion that if there is a decision to press forward uh, with a wage theft ordinance, my hope is that it helps these um, those that feel disadvantaged and feel that they need more protection. It's going to be hard in terms of visualizing what it's going to look like in Northampton. Um, I myself is I'm having trouble with visualizing of examples, but um, it would be a huge step forward to providing 
a revolutionary protection for to, for people who usually are not protected um, and in, in many senses and exploited. But thank you. <coughs> Can I encourage someone else to speak? Anyone anyone else like to come and speak? No? Okay, then I'm going to um, go back to Patrick Burke, please. Hey, uh, Patrick Burke, uh, 218 State Street, Northampton, Mass. So I actually am a resident. I could have could have just said that. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I, I also happen to work for the uh, United Food and Commercial Workers Union, uh, local uh, 1459 out of Springfield, but we cover Western Mass in Vermont. So as an organizer, you know, I basically spend all my time talking to workers about issues on the job, whether it's our own members um, or it's mostly for me, folks who don't have a union. And the thing is, is that we have, it's free, it's interesting, a lot of, you know, major employers, you know, in their own propaganda about, you know, why we don't need unions, talk about, well, there's all these laws on the books, but the problem is, as many other folks have echoed, is that even when there's a law on the book, it doesn't mean it's going to get enforced because of all the varied reasons um, that people have stated, um, immigration status, um, feeling that they have no one to turn to, not knowing the law is a legal situation. And, you know, just because you have a poster somewhere in back that you may, may look at once, you know, the whole time you're employed doesn't mean you're going to know all these laws um, and how to enforce them. So I feel like, you know, the general thrust here is that it's important, you know, not just, and I think, again, it, it, it's, it's an epidemic, like uh, Harris said, it's not as if Northampton has anything particularly bad or anything particularly worse than any other community, but, you know, there's a movement, um, in, including in many communities in, the, in Eastern Mass, but across the country, of really taking wage theft seriously, um, of really trying to improve the lives of uh, re, um, restaurant and service workers. And this is an opportunity with, you know, some of the, uh, or the ordinance that some other councils are working on to take a proactive step that really um, other communities in Massachusetts have already taken. And I think, you know, just kind of going back, um, I think the general idea, and I, I again, I haven't actually read the, some of the proposals, but, you know, there, there have been communities where, you know, they kind of, uh, you know, work with an existing community group to help, you know, you know, and educate people about their rights. Because again, you know, you know, we, you know, I've worked with the Attorney General's Office, I work with the National Labor Relations Board, all these agencies, and they really, you know, the only reason, you know, the workers, <laughs> you know, most of the people that I've talked to in my organizing would never have brought these, brought a complaint up uh, about their rights being violated without having met me. And, um, you know, things kind of coming to a, a boiling point. Um, you know, usually I don't get a talk, you know, someone doesn't call me on the blue unless, you know, there's really egregious uh, things going on, wherever that might be. Um, so this is really a proactive way to keep on top of it, to, um, you know, educate the community, educate the workforce, and educate employers about how, you know, how we can enforce the laws better that are already on the books. And just as a, so that, that's really my statement in support of that. I will just, you know, just because this is about downtown generally, um, I also have another hat. I, I'm, uh, I'm on the PVTA board representing riders. Um, so the uh, rep for the PVTA here in, in Northampton is, is the mayor, where he does a good job. But I also feel like, um, you know, for me, you know, with riders, um, issues of affordability and access um, to public transit are very important. You know, we still have a system that really needs a lot more money, but there are things that can be done in the community to support um, more ridership. And I hope maybe that we can think about um, ways to encourage uh, some of the larger employers, some of some of whom my union even represents, to uh, to encourage more use of public transit and you know have a positive vision of uh, of our community in terms of. Uh, uh, transit uh, equity so I think um, but I think again like one of the important things here is that it's it's really I really thank everyone for hosting this forum because it's it's so rare that you have an opportunity to ask workers what they feel and think and their perspective um, because we have a kind of a, a society and a dialogue that you know rightfully you know uh, talks about the benefits of entrepreneurship and small business but it's, you know, it's important to get a full-sided perspective on these issues and to really see what's going on in our community and come up with solutions together. So again, you know, thank you for doing this. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Um, Rose? I 
Hi, I'm Rose Bookbinder of 6 High Street in Haydenville, but I grew up um, here in Northampton, went away for college to work a little bit, but um, mostly have spent my life in Northampton upwards of 25 years, so I'm 32, but I was gone for some time. So um, I've seen a lot of changes in Northampton, and um, first want to thank you for hosting um, these forums and thanks to everyone that says has said stuff and bravely spoken out because it's scary as a worker to come here knowing it's being recorded and that you're sit, sit, standing in front of city government speaking so thank you for your um, courage for doing that um, I first I, I am um, part of the Pioneer Valley Worker Center but first I want to sort of speak more as a worker in town I work at 42 Gothic Street so I um, frequent town very often and I attended the business forum a few weeks ago and I just wanted to speak to some of the things that I heard there at first and also I want to second what I'm sorry what was your name that spoke to all the positive kind of things we can do and John Wynn. yeah I, those are like awesome ideas and I unfortunately felt like I didn't hear a lot of those positive ideas come out of the business forum um, and it felt like a lot of the things that were said weren't things you all could actually do anything about um, because of the laws that we have in terms of how local municipalities can actually you know enforce for example panhandling because we know that's free speech and I want to say that the vibrant sidewalks resolution that you all passed like I think that was a beautiful resolution and um, personally I eat out almost every day for lunch in town and go out to eat a lot with my daughter and when we see people asking for money I see it as an opportunity to talk to her about injustice that exists in our economy ways that people are disenfranchised because of um, racism or sexism or, or different things that happen in terms of our capitalist society and so I see it as an opportunity I never find myself not wanting to go to town and I think any city you go to you see people on the street that makes a vibrant city you see people of different um, you know backgrounds and experiences and and um, so I, you know I, I just that was a lot of talk about that and I just wanted to say that I think the city has been doing the right thing in terms of that and I encourage you to continue the resolution of vibrant sidewalks um, and I've also seen a lot of great things you have done to support businesses in town and so I'm here to say let's figure out how we can continue to support businesses and also figure out how we can support workers at the same time and so in your conclusion of, of these hearings, I'm hoping that one of the outcomes will be to think about how we can pass a wage theft ordinance, um, because I think not only it supports our you know residents um, by en enforcing the laws so that the businesses are actually um, paying the taxes that they're supposed to. Um, it really supports businesses who are put at competitive disadvantage when other businesses aren't following the law. And I think a lot of the folks that were actually at this business forum a few weeks back are the ones that are following the law. And so, you know, if they realize that they're, that all the other folks that are actually not following the laws are doing that, they would see that this is actually to their benefit as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, bottom line, it supports workers. Um, and you asked a lot about how that happens, and so I can explain explain that but first I just wanted to just lay out some of the the problem um, Harris did this and others have too but in Massachusetts um, 700 million dollars are stolen in wages from approximately 350,000 low-wage workers each year in Massachusetts and only um, five million two hundred dollars of wages are recovered on average by the Attorney General so obviously you can see like 600 million blah 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 blah, blah is still being stolen each year from workers. So, you know, overall workers are only getting back less than 1% of the wages that have been stolen from them. And annual losses to the state is over $280 million um, due to um, jobs that are lost because, and then also due to loss of taxes. Um, so while low-wage workers and families are hardest hit, the whole state is cheated out of greater economic activity, more jobs, and tax revenue. So what you see is, you know, an employer hiring a worker for 80 hours a week, not paying them minimum wage, paying them half of minimum wage. So they're having to do two workers' jobs, right? So we could, that would be another job that we could create in the city if workers were, if employers were actually following the laws. Um, and so the way that it um, increases um, accountability and holds businesses that contract for labor or services accountable for wage theft violations is by connecting their business activities to their business licenses. Right now, as others spoke about, you know, it, you, the, you, you can just kind of, you know, tack up that uh, notice on the wall or you pay back the wages and then you just keep going on the same. But what it does is it ties your liquor license, your food and beverage license, or your permit 
to your compliance with wage and hour laws. And so what that means is that they have to sign an affidavit with our local, um, with, with, the, with the business office. And, and, and in Boston, they already passed it. In Chelsea, in um, Somerville, and Cambridge, this has already been passed, a wage theft ordinance. We gave you example language um, at the very beginning. And so we in Northampton could be the first in Western Mass to pass this wage theft ordinance and be on the front lines of tackling this really epidemic issue, which I think would be very exciting. And for Northampton, who's you know been ahead of the curve to continue that by doing this is, a, is an exciting opportunity. Um, so that yeah. was the buzzer. Oh, oh, sorry. OK, yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ms. Bookbinder? Yeah. Um, again, I, I'm kind of a nuts and bolts uh, how, how to actually make yeah. it work because I, I'm, I'm one of those not particularly interested in something that's just more lip service. Uh, you know, more, more, more language that sounds good, but there's really no there there. So, uh, and I haven't seen the, the proposed ordinance, so I have a general idea. Yeah, it was in the folder that I gave you. Well, okay. So you can take a look. But I'm happy to answer. I also, that. just to reiterate, I've, as I've said many times, we are not deliberating on anything that we've received until after everyone's been heard and all the forms are over. So oh, you're not reading it. Well, I mean, we could read it, but we oh. haven't discussed, you know, we have to discuss everything in public as a body, so. Oh, sure, no, um, I was just letting him. So I'm just, no, I'm no. explaining that, You know, he why. does have yeah. the example. No, I, I've, yeah, yeah, that's all. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I I've looked through it, so I have, a, I, have a, I have a general yeah. sense of it. Yeah. So I, I get one, 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 of, one of the avenues to, to, to really get at this problem <laughs> is uh, when anybody is seeking renewal of their liquor license, for example, yeah. they have to sign an affidavit that they are in compliance with all wage laws and everything else. Correct. Yeah. Well, that sounds great, but but who ascertains that when they have signed that affidavit, they're 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 telling the truth? Where this where, where this has been implemented elsewhere? Where, where where does how does how does that happen? Sure. So um, I think that's where the worker center, or for example, in um, in Burlington, Vermont, they have a living wage ordinance there. They can pass you know a living wage that's above. Um, minimum above uh, the minimum wage in municipalities unlike we can do here but what they've done there is they've contracted with a local organization who actually goes out and does monitoring um, you know someone else spoke to the fact that if you are going to be um, doing some building in your or updating your house or updating your business um, you have someone comes in and does an inspection or there's a yearly health inspection that goes on and there's no yearly inspection to make sure that wage and hour laws are being enforced so that's one creative idea they it's a part-time position um, they got grant money to be able to support it and they have someone that actually goes in goes out and talks to workers but also the worker center you know really operates in that way we have workers that come in um, we have a, what we call like a, um, a worker community task force that um, when workers come to us and tell us that they're experiencing something in their workplace um, we oftentimes try to mediate with the employer um, you know it's we, we're not trying to you know put places out of business these are the jobs that these workers need but they also deserve the dignity and respect for the laws to be followed and so um, if you have a conversation with someone and say you know if we report you and let and let folks know that you're not following the law then you are at risk of losing your business license then hopefully they're willing to sit down and negotiate and try to make amends rather than us having to fi file um, a wage theft complaint which can you know they're responsible for trouble damages meaning they have to pay three times what um, they owed that worker but we're really trying to have a partnership where we're trying to deal locally with with the breaking of laws and so the worker center does that um, as Patrick said unions do that and so adding the extra leverage of the business license I think um, encourages employers to think a little bit more about violating the law because that's I mean that's a pretty significant thing you could lose your whole business right if you um, are found to be in violation of the law and so I think you're right someone could theoretically not say that they are following the law but it's a it's a much bigger deal <laughs> at that point because you could be out of uh, owning your business if you're not complying the city of Boston which is a much larger city does did create an office of wage theft um, and when we have been talking like, talking with community members and counselors about this we talked about being creative about creating an office of wage theft that would be regional just as like the city inspector for example goes and inspects Williamsburg and Haydenville like it's a, a cooperative um, 
st a joint staff person. So I think there are ways to think creatively about an enforcement mechanism um, that wouldn't uh, infringe on a already tight budget. Does that mean that you're organizing with other communities to pass an ordinance? Because, I mean, if we were going to do it regionally, they would have to sign on, right? Well, I think that would be like a long term. I think immediate um, need would be like pass something locally. But long term, you know, I think we could think creatively about how we're enforcing regionally. We are working in Springfield and other places, um, but uh, not not with Williamsburg or Hainville, for example. Like that's not happening in terms of the same thing with the inspector. But in Boston, it was a multi-year process. They didn't create the Office of Wage Theft in the first year, they, but they passed the ordinance. And um, this also, you know, affects contractors and um, other. You know, it's it's not just. I know a lot of folks folks talked about restaurants because that's a low-wage economy that's really affected. But at the next hearing, we will have um, folks from the carpenters' union who you know meet a lot with folks in the construction area that experience wage theft as well. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for for the current um, language, and then you know thinking long term would be great. But uh, you know, a regional thing I think would take. Some some time, and and also I you know so that you're aware there is um, a bill at the state level too that would increase some of this stuff. So being a part of passing it locally and in our municipality um, will help to really move the agenda forward on a state level. Yeah, and I'll just say you know when we first um, started out you know we were thinking big and trying to figure out how we could you know enforce living wages or do things like this but the reality is as we started talking to workers and we opened our office we realized unfortunately you know so many of our laws aren't being enforced and we have to think about how to make systemic change to do that and rather than going after one business at a time this is an opportunity to just raise standards in all of Northampton and make sure that our economy is really thriving Sorry, did you have another question? Yeah, just one one follow up. In in Burlington or other places where 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 the the sort of inspection compliance mm -hmm. role, if you will, has been outsourced mm -hmm. to to an organization. So the the report comes back to a local licensing board. Right. And then is is does the does the business in question have their uh, their day in court? I mean, is there is there is there due process? Yeah. And and, and then mm -hmm. and then. How, who handles that? Sure. Where, do the, where do the resources come from sure. for those hearings? So the way it works in Massachusetts with the wage theft ordinance that have been passed is that it just streamlines the wage theft cases to the Attorney General's office because they've already gotten a look over. I mean, the thing is is that they're getting bombarded with wage theft cases all the time and they can't keep up. But if a local, munis a local municipality has said, you know, the person we've contracted thinks this is a legitimate case, or you have a lawyer that you go to, for example, that you contract with, that you say, can you look this over? Then it just streamlines it so that it goes faster through the attorney general's office. And so that, that's the same, yeah, so it would still need to be processed, and there would still be the, right. you know, legal process that happens, um, but it just makes it faster, and, it, and it's a partnership between, uh, this, between the municipality and the state. But at the local level, where it's a licensing decision or a right. licensing renewal decision, how, where, 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 where is, how does that process work? The, the the report comes in, and w in one direction it goes off the AT's AG's office expedited. Right. But in the other direction, it's at the at the you know the licensing board's decision. Right. Are we going to renew this license or not? Right. So they wouldn't if it if the if it was found that they were in violation of wage theft and they're not paying what they owe to those workers, the back wages, or if they've been find, found to have sexual harassment or discrimination, whatever it is, whatever the remedy is that the Attorney General determines, if the business is not following that, then the re the renewal would not happen. And I there's also a lien put on the business that- So you're not proposing that the, the city or town would independently decide on oh, licensing no. absent a determination from the no. AP's office? No. Okay. There's a step in this process too that I think somehow kind of got obfuscated which is that as soon as a business comes to the city to get whatever license it is the city is in contact with the AG's office to see if anything has been filed already so that that could be the first trigger point so that's also a way that it can happen so that you don't have to have necessarily an enforcing body locally okay. I'm trying to understand how the yeah. how the pieces would actually it's complicated work. yeah <laughs> yeah any other questions? Um, would anyone else like to speak? 
Yes. Um, my name is Vanessa Calderon. I live on Hubbard Ave in Northampton. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, I guess to me it's not really a question of budgeting, even though I know you have to figure that out. I think it's more a question of what's our value in this community, and we need to decide if our value is um, is to protect workers, then we need to decide that we're going to take action, and then we can decide and figure out how we're going to do that. Um, so to me, I think we need to um, decide to protect people because that's what our val what our community values, um, and once we decide that, we can move forward and we can decide how we're going to protect folks. Um, and it can be totally creative. It doesn't have to be something where it drains a budget or anything like that. We can figure it out and we can protect people. Thank you. Anybody else? Once, twice, no? I can't encourage anyone else to speak? No. Well, if, if there's no one else who'd like to speak, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I agree that it, it is a courageous thing. It, it's just courageous to speak in public, period. Trust me, I struggle with it all the time. Um, but certainly to speak on these issues, it's, it's a tough thing. So I thank you very much um, for being brave and doing that and appreciate all that you told us today. So thank you. And also, if anyone didn't speak um, but has something that they'd like to share with us, please go ahead and you can submit written testimony to us that will be part of this record and we will all read and um, hear what you have to say that way. So you can do that by um, emailing our administrative assistant, Pam Powers. So that's ppowers at northamptonma.gov. Um, if you don't remember that, you can go, if you go to the city council website, you can get her email there. So please feel free to submit testimony to us in writing uh, if you didn't feel comfortable today talking. But thank you very, very much, everyone, for coming. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So. Hi, Allie. Hi. <laughs> Was maybe like a report that I took in Yeah, yeah. I so I realized that it didn't make sense to take our minutes and highlight the city for the time before until you all had a place in the minutes. Oh, I see. So I did not do that. Um, but now that. adjourned as a meeting, so um, if everyone exits, we can just finish our meeting, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. I know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need a bouncer. You have to be, you have to be six six. Or really deep voice. Where's Bill? Ham's got it. They're all in the same place. Hi, I'm Bill. How are you? Oh, hi. How are you? I'm Bill. 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 I'm B
thing. I got it. Oh, great. Man. Thank you. <laughs> still, still in a meeting. Okay. Um, so what I was saying was, I talked about taking the minutes from the previous meeting, you know, from the forums and sort of pulling together chapters, if you will, for the report that we need to submit to the full council. It occurred to me that it didn't make sense to do that until the minutes had been approved. Right. So I did not do that for the past forum. Um, I can now start working on that for the one that we've already had and we'll figure out how to do it for, you know, the minutes as we go along. So does that mean you're using the minutes as the report per se or you're actually like doing some kind of analysis how is that happening what do you mean well I mean I think what we talked about is that you know the the report doesn't necessarily that to sort of meet our timeline we won't necessarily be able to deliberate so and having spoken to um, council president and vice president about it their expectations aren't that we would sort of really have an analyzed you know, a report that analyzes everything we heard more that it sort of says what we had done to sort of fulfill the study and then um, moving forward we can deliberate on what we learned so what I had thought to do was to take the minutes and maybe flesh them out a little bit more to say you know this we heard from this many people on this you know this many business owners and these were the themes that we heard and um, and then kind of put them each forum together um, with, you know, a, a, a closing paragraph, and that would be the report, and then further work we would do, prob realistically, probably in September, because um, I don't believe we're meeting in August. So, that's, that's what I was thinking, and that explains why I did not do that for the, for the last forum. Um, so, is that what, yeah? Um, and so then number five was the public forum we just did and then noting that we have the next two are net ones a, a week from today on June 27th at 1 p.m. here in the chambers and then the last one is Monday July 18th at 5 30 p.m. here in the chambers um, the next one is also uh, regarding downtown workers and the final one is regarding property owners leasing arts and tourism um, and then I don't have any new business. Does anyone else have any new business to discuss? No. Nope. Okay. Then move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much.